Welcome to another episode of Uncovering Possibilities, and we are here with the amazing Dr. Mary Ellen Pohl from Carnegie Mellon University. So, uh, Dr. Pohl, hello. Nice to see you again. It is great to see you again, Ogechi. And I'm, I'm just, can you tell our audience about yourself? Right now, I'm the Dean of the College of Fine Arts at CMU in Pittsburgh. And before I took this job in 2021, I was, as you know, uh, spending seven years as director of the Butler School at UT Austin. And before that, 11 years as dean of the San Francisco Conservatory. So I'm a musicologist and a flutist by training, but now I work with architects and visual artists and designers and theater folk as well as musicians. So my life has suddenly gotten a lot more interesting. <laughs> that sounds very interesting. So you, cause here at the Butler school, you were working primarily with musicians and now it seems like you're, you, you know, you're working with a lot more different types of people. So what, what exactly do you do <laughs> at CMU? So I, well, obviously we have five schools and one interdisciplinary unit and uh, an Institute for Contemporary Art and this crazy thing called the studio, which is where art and technology come together in experimental laboratory kind of ways. Hmm. So I, all eight of those leaders report to me. Um, but I would say kind of in a metaphorical sense, I'm like a chief noisemaker <laughs> and an advocate for the arts at a university that is very focused on STEM. Absolutely. Um, it was created as a place for engineering and industry and things like that. And I think of it as my job to help community members and that includes my boss, the provost and his boss, the president, to understand how the arts are different. Our business model is different. Um, and at the same time, our contributions to the university and to society are, are priceless. And I realized when I got here, somebody has to keep saying that over and over and over again. So I'm a little bit obnoxious. <laughs> but in the best possible right, way, right? In the yeah. most productive possible Absolutely. way. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so this year, and I'm sure since you got to CMU, I know you're you're still kind of would it be fair to say you're figuring out the lay of the land a little bit, just trying to see how to involve yourselves in these conversations and insert yourself in a different um, thing so you can solve problems? Is that still fair to say? Yeah, that's absolutely fair to say. And I'm, mm. I'm still figuring out when I can, um, you know, where are the most productive places to make that noise mm. and to kind of leverage those conversations absolutely. because... CMU, very interesting culture. You know, I've been at four mm. different universities and every one of them was radically different from the one before. Mm -hmm. And this one, we have 15,000 students, so quite a bit smaller than UT, but quite a bit larger than the first two schools I worked at. And it's very, um, it's a private institution. A lot of people have been there their whole working lives. And so for somebody like me to come in uh, from the outside and every now and then I'm like, uh, hello, <laughs> why on earth have you been doing it that way? <laughs> right. So it's, yeah, I'm figuring it out. I mean, I've been here 21 months now, mm -hmm. but who's counting? And uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I, I feel like I'll really know it at the end of next year. Oh, okay. So, so it's yeah. kind of like a, maybe a three-year plan of just kind of reconnaissance and yeah. <laughs> almost yeah. in a way. I feel, I think of myself as an anthropologist in mm. academia and looking at the various peoples. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, their weird customs. So, so, so in March, or well, sorry, April, 2023, um, at CMU specifically, what, what issues, what problems are you seeing? Or what, what, what are the ones that you're most like, okay, we need to maybe have a very pointed attack or a very po pointed mm -hmm. um, you know, plan for addressing? Yeah, well, we are not immune from very many of the issues that affect society and academia. Sure. And, yes. and yet we're specific and particular. 
Um, I think because we are so focused on STEM and technology here, we are having a lot of conversations, some of them conscious, some of them mm -hmm. not so conscious mm -hmm. about all the things that kind of dehumanize us today. I mean, we're all afraid of a climate catastrophe and with good reason. Um, white supremacy and patriarchy are in what I hope are their death throes, but they are not giving up without a big fight. And one example of this, of course, is the Supreme Court decision that's about to come down about considering race and admissions um, and totally shut, shutting that possibility off. So how are we going to continue with our goals of, you know, equity, inclusion, belonging, all those things, but if we can't even get a diverse class, if we can't hire faculty from a variety of backgrounds, how are we ever going to make progress on that? So we're all, you know, kind of putting our heads together and using our creative energies to figure that out. I mean, at CMU, honestly, we talk a lot about AI. And we worry about whether it's going to replace our brains and our students' brains. Um, but what I keep saying is over and over, the arts really do bring us back to ourselves and they bring us back to each other. And if artists are not a part of these conversations about climate justice and AI, then we're in big trouble. Amen. So, I mean, I you're preaching to the choir here, but how how are these messages received by i think the the kind of quaint um sort of thing is steam when they want to try to introduce yeah. <laughs> you know put a in there and and you know turn stem into steam but how how is that how is that received on, on your ca campus well you know we're in a capitalist society and uh, <laughs> a neoliberal university i'm aware <laughs> yes Right. And, you know, money talks and right. the um, School of Computer Science and the College of Engineering get these federal grants in the high eight figures all the time right. and, and right. sometimes nine figures. Mm -hmm. And so trying to um, compete with that, I always say we have to get by on our charm and good looks mm -hmm. and also again kind of be persistently present at the table whenever we can mm -hmm. but i i think that um sometimes i will confess i think that my i i love my dean colleagues i would not trade them they're great they're funny they're brilliant uh they've accepted me but sometimes i do feel a little bit like the mascot you know <laughs> Oh, isn't she? Yay. Isn't she cute? She's so we, sarcastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have the arts lady here. She's yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm I'm your token uh, <laughs> person who always brings up that weird angle that nobody's right because I'm the arts person. Right. I, I but I would imagine that's that's accepted in some way and needed, right? Wouldn't they, wouldn't they wouldn't they even admit that? Hopefully they they are showing signs of seeing the value in that. We Good. um actually, the biggest building our campus has ever built is going up. Um, it's being designed even as we speak. It's for the S College of Science mm. and the College of Com and the School of Computer Science has a couple of floors on it too. Mm -hmm. um, but they invited us to be ten percent of this building. So we're moving wow. our Institute of Contemporary Art, which is kind of like a a gallery that only works with living artists yeah. over to that building, which happens to be right next door to the Carnegie Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And I have felt like a full partner in all these discussions. And so I think um, some of my colleagues really do get it. So the, the ANT, you call it the studio at, mm -hmm. I, I guess that's a specific term at, at CMU. Um, I, I mean, is that something that you feel kind of arts is maybe trending towards? Because I'm I'm noticing departments like that pop pop up here at UT. There's mm -hmm. definitely the NT here, and so yeah. What what are your thoughts on that? I, th I think it's less that it's trending toward or taking over than it is mm. something that we. It's a it's a tool mm. 
of mm -hmm. expression that we cannot ignore and can and have to interact with. Um, and the really interesting thing about, about the studio, it, the full name is the Studio for Creative Inquiry. So it's kind of, we think of it as our laboratory. And it's not just interaction with technology, but it's critiquing it as well, mm -hmm. which is something we really need at CMU because we get so excited about the latest mm -hmm. robotics or the AI or whatever. And then things, we start to realize that they're big ethical questions. Absolutely. And I think computer science especially has, the, the dean there is super, super sharp. And he wants to work more, not less, with the College of Fine Arts because he thinks it's going to result in better products for his school. Oh, that's that's wonderful. And this kind of transitions to the next thing because we talked about problems sort of inherent with spe specifically at your campus. And if we zoom out mm -hmm. sort of societally, even culturally, but what are some things you're excited about um, at your campus specifically, but even the future of the arts? Yeah, I think... On, on our campus, obviously, that I feel that this is a place that actually does try to use its powers for good. Mm -hmm. um, and I noted that when I first, because I kind of was ignoring their emails and their calls when they were reaching out to me, because I was like, well, you know, the music school, that's, you know, it's a, it's a music school, but I've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize the power that the interaction of architecture and design and visual mm -hmm. arts and drama would have um, on our ability to make this argument for the arts and society. So um, mm. that that aspect of it and the lever the some of the things that are going on in the school of drama, they have an actual anti-racist theater curriculum now. Wow. That is, you know, I mean, it's it's being implemented even as we speak. And, you know, there's mm -hmm. some bumps on the roads because people come in and they're like, whoa, this is yeah. blowing my mind apart. Am yeah. I ready to absorb this? But we're determined to stick with it and make it work. Um, design and architecture are looking at different pedagogies mm -hmm. that can be more responsive to who our students are today because right. design and architecture and music same thing music and drama what are the um what are the the barriers that we put up to student success mm. so i'm excited about that conversation that's taking place i'm excited about the university as a whole really wanting to um leverage its in the incredible intellect and its connections uh, we're not a really wealthy university. Our mm -hmm. our endowment is not large, mm -hmm. but I think much as artists always do, we kind of um, make the most of what we have. So, uh, so would you say that, or not that that I guess the arts and the school of the arts is maybe leading the way, maybe curriculum wise more maybe progressive curriculum, just different ideas about how to approach their work, their teaching, how to engage with students. Yeah, I mean, it. It honestly, it's maybe too early to say, but mm. I really think okay. it will. Um, mm -hmm. We are partly because of some of the things that happen within these curricula and, and the sort of slow evolution of what's going on within them, which is sometimes painful. Mm. Um, we end up Yes. Talking to the lawyers every now and then, <laughs> you know, which is one of the joys of being a dean. You get to know the lawyers really well. <laughs> Fun. And um, I think it's eventually going to result in changes in policies and procedures at the university level, which is really wow. encouraging. Yeah, that's that's incredible. That's yeah. incredible to, to see. So maybe kind of pointing the light sort of at you a little bit. Um, can we talk about your skills the art, artistic and otherwise that you cultivate or, or possess that serve you well in your current role first of all a musician who goes into a position of leadership whether it's in music or outside mm -hmm. of music and this gets at a little bit of your all tac mm -hmm. question <laughs> uh, what are our transferable skills we we mm -hmm. know how to listen mm -hmm. 
and we know how to step back and listen yeah. and reflect and critique. And before I make any kind of decision, uh, no matter how um, inflamed the situation is before me now, I try to really listen deeply. Um, I think musician, and I have made this offer a million times to the president's office at my university, say, listen, artists know how to put on a show and we can help you with your road show, not just for show, but in order to communicate more effectively. Huh. You know, more, we know, I mean, the yeah. Longhorn Band knows how to put on a show. It knows how right. to pace the show. Right. It knows how to do an introduction. It knows how to do a finale. And what I'm learning, because I'm up close and personal with all these scientists, bless their hearts, they have no <laughs> idea how to do this. Right. So I have found, and, and I try to be, you know, polite about it, but sure. I have <laughs> that we really do have something to offer them in terms of helping them communicate better. Um, in terms of my own personal skills, not just an artist skills, the one thing that I will not delegate to anybody um, is putting words down on paper. Mm. But I think it's so important for leaders to speak with their own voice and not just have some, you know, PR person doing yes. it. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just the most authentic, the most engaging, I think. Yeah. That, okay. That's, that's really cool. So can we talk about your leadership style then? How would you describe it? And um, like, do you have to adjust it as you're, you know, maybe working between different constituents within the university and in, in and out? I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious to know about that. I think one of the really nice things about this current job is that mm -hmm answer to that last part of your question mm -hmm. is almost no because That's awesome. yeah yeah I mean being able to be authentic whether I'm in a meeting with my boss or my fellow deans or my associate deans or my school heads or a student or a parent if I can be the same person in all of those places more or less um, it's a lot less exhausting. Amen. Yeah. You know, yes. Because the, I, I mean, I don't want to appropriate the term code switching because it's <laughs> yeah. much less serious than the kind of code switching right. yes. your folks have to do. But yes, I try to, you know, and do you edit yourself? Of course, of course. you do. You know? right. But I really don't. Um, I feel like one reason I know that this is a good place for me is that I find myself having to do that much less than That's, I did in the past. I yeah. like that as a kind of a good sort of barometer for, it's, for it's, finding where you need to be or it's discovering metric. where you are. Yeah. 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 But in terms of my leadership style, and I always smile because this is the question you always get asked on um, job interviews, or they might say your management style. Sure. And of course, I'm always tempted to blow it up and say, I am the biggest tyrant you will ever meet. Everyone has to <laughs> what they say immediately. Um, but I think partly because of the way I've seen things handled by other people, I really try not to see the dean's office or the college, because I've got five wacky individualistic schools. I've got three mm. units that are also highly individualistic. The College of Fine Arts is not a setting for my ego or my vision. Mm. You know, no matter how many times people say, what's your vision? Right. They, the vision, it is what is being manifested by these eight units right now. Mm. Are there commonalities? Yes, but because we've worked together to articulate them, not because I'm imposing them. And yeah. I really try to put students and faculty and staff in the spotlight all the time because they're the ones who, I mean, I'm a shell of a husk of a musician these days. <laughs> My faculty and student colleagues are the ones who are doing the work. Right. And they're in the work and they're at the cutting edge and they are actively engaged in their art. And I mean, sometimes I think people want me to be a little more deanly or deanish, but I tend to resist that. 
So you're like the true um, definition of an administrator in that you're there to facilitate and help. And because I, because I don't know, I, it, it seems like they're, they're just, I don't know, lately it seems to be maybe more negative connotations. Yeah, I think, that I think that word does kind of has bureaucratic connotation. Absolutely. Yeah, I do think it is important to make things run well, mm -hmm. but there's got to be behind it uh, a consensus that you're developing with your leadership mm -hmm. about what the values of the place are. And so mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't want it to sound like I'm 100% hands off and just let them yeah. run wild and free because <laughs> they, they would given the chance. <laughs> yes. But I really don't, I, it's about them. It's not about me. Mm -hmm. And um, that some, like once a year, I have to write up my self-evaluation from my boss. So I'll, I'll say, oh, it's all about me now. And I'll put that into the self-evaluation, but that's really about the only place it shows up. So if I can review, you said the five different colleges, music, drama, architecture, architecture, art, art, so visual art and design. Visual. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that couldn't be more different. That, yeah. That really couldn't be. So, you, but in each of those, I mean, obviously each of those colleges you have, you're managing, you're leading artists and, and mm -hmm. academics. And so- mm -hmm. I mean, e even if when your time here at UT and your time now at CMU, um, you know, kind of in the spirit of our, of our podcast, Alt-Ac, um, when you observe the, the people that you work with every day, like how, how do you see that manifesting in their own lives, in their own careers, how they relate to students, how they relate to you, how they relate to the community? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, any stories, any anecdotal or otherwise? So I think obviously in the arts, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in science and business and things like that, you have people who consult sure. and, you know, but a lot of their work, because it's so lucrative for it to be within the university, it has to be there. But when you have a school of drama and you have a faculty member who's going up for tenure, they have to do outside shows mm -hmm. somehow. So how do you facilitate that for them and not tell them, no, you have to be here mm -hmm. 24-7, 365 days a year, because, you know, to be honest, doing those outside shows, um, I mean, one of our stage managers works at Disneyland Shanghai. Oh, my. And others work at New York and in Oregon Shakespeare Festival and all these other different places. That's just the school of drama. But they have to have outside activities of some sort um, in order to be at the edge of their fields and to be able to be the most effective teachers for our students. Um, in terms of the Alt-Ac idea, which I think is really relevant for people at your stage mm -hmm. of the career, I think, um, I don't have any magic answers about that, sure. but I, I do think there are psychological and emotional factors that we have to consider because otherwise we end up Kind of stigmatizing and beating ourselves up. I mean, I think we all come to academia when we're, you know, between the ages of 18 and 22. And that's probably when some of us first think, oh, this professor thing looks so cool. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I've yeah. had undergrads come to me and say, how do I get to be a dean? And I'm like, oh, Ooh, honey. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, so we're for a impressionable, yeah. you know, and we don't have mm -hmm. great judgment skills. That part of the brain isn't developed yet. You know, we can't even mm -hmm. get full car insurance yet by that point. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes and sometimes the professors, it's on them. You know, they encourage us to be just like them, mm. and you know, become little mm. mini me's. It's my mm. legacy. Da, 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 da. So we take on this identity of the aspiring academic, just like we did as a musician. You know, I am a, mm -hmm. I'm a flutist and my flute is part of who I am and I'm going to be a professor and that's part of who I am. So we get this emotional attachment to it, mm -hmm. which in the case of academia, <laughs> uh, probably not a good idea to invest your emotions in this goal because of capitalism and market forces. And right now, honestly, politics. Yes. 
Yeah, yes. Anybody in a public institution in this country right now knows this well. So if a groovy and appropriate first job doesn't open right up for us, we are crushed and feel like, oh, I can't go on. I have to quit immediately and stop trying. Or, you know, some people keep trying and become incredibly bitter. Some people even who land tenure track positions, if it's not where they thought they should be, like I thought I should be at Harvard by now, mm. they're still bitter. They, this, I don't know what it is about our inability to shine where we are, mm. but I really think it's kind of a, it's a disease. So I wish in, especially in the arts and humanities in academia, I wish we could all find ways to be more honest and at the same time, more imaginative and more proactive in helping our students think about how these skills they're developing can help them find satisfaction and happiness in a wide range of possibilities. But I think, you know, we're addicted to grad students in academia. We are, we can't, we can't quit you. Because, you know, you teach our classes for us that those full professors do not want to teach. I am being brutally honest here, throwing all my colleagues. I under so appreciate it, though. And, I, the, the, and, and again, to, to the honesty piece you just said, I think if, any, if anyone's being really honest, they'd be like, yeah, that, she's 100 percent right. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. Academia is <laughs> not the only place you can be happy. Yeah. And, and it's also not. I mean, this is going to be even more brutal. Um, mm -hmm. It's not your family. It's not your mm -hmm. home. It's a business that is currently mm -hmm. undergoing a correction due to demographics, due to political turmoil. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily owe us anything even more than Elon, any more than Elon does his employees, <laughs> which apparently is not much. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. It's, we can't see it as the only one way we can make a contribution. See, this was going to transition to asking for advice, but I mean, I think you just like you gave it to us. I've never really seen an, a, a real life golden bullet or is that what it's called that term? But that was it. <laughs> that was it. I mean, that was everything. That was that was the last question in the very the last question I asked and the very last question I was going to ask, which was advice. And I think just the piece about being honest and not seeking your full identity and your a meaning in in academia mm -hmm. and being more imaginative and being more um i mean is, is do you want to speak more is there and is there anything more you can speak to with with regard to that that as far as uh advice for artists future well, administrators like, like you in academia? yeah it's more like an aspiration than advice mm -hmm. because okay please you know, i'm terrible at taking my own advice <laughs> um but i do think that an aspiration for all human beings should be to try to be a little more detached mm -hmm. from outcomes. Because if you're, if you have that certain level of confidence in yourself and your worth, then you will not be so buffeted around by one disappointment here or one you know, I've had so many big changes of direction in my career. Mm -hmm. And every single time there was this little voice in me that said, ah, that's kind of a failure. You know, that's you, you didn't achieve exactly what you thought you were going to achieve when you were 22 years old and knew everything. Mm -hmm. So being willing to um, embrace big changes in life as absolute learning experiences i think um at the very least you'll never be bored <laughs> amen <laughs> amen wow i think we're gonna leave it like that leave it at that thank you so much for your it's wisdom and pleasure. your yeah and your and your passion is just just shines through and i, I really appreciate you taking some time to talk with me and our audience so a, a complete pleasure and an honor. Thanks for asking me.